So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dorian Kuo and I'm part of the Sustainability Committee with the British Chamber of Commerce. Um, so one of the goals of the Sustainability Committee is really to work closely with businesses in the region um, to help influence and really create systemic change in the way they operate in the economic, social and environmental space. Uh, so the event today is a collaborative event uh, from the diversity and inclusion, the built environment and the sustainability committees. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our, um, the Chamber's uh, DNI sponsor, Barclays, who is also the sponsor for the event today. So before I introduce the um, panel, um, uh, let me just say a few words about the, um, the event. So according to the World Health Organization, about 2 billion people um, live with a disability. Um, and that, that represents about 37.5% of the world's population. Um, so sadly, some of these disabilities are invisible. And with 50% of the population, the world's population living in cities, um, I personally feel that there's definitely a great opportunity to review and future-proof the inclusion of these invisible disabilities on the city's planning agenda. Um, so hopefully today um, you'll learn um, some of the key challenges um, from various industries. Um, and in order in that journey in creating a sustainable and resilient ecosystem for this community in particular. So now let me go off to um, who's joining us today. So we've got uh, Ron Lowe, who's the director of the Enablers Development um, Team at SG Enable. Uh, we've got Batya Shulman, who's a partner at St. James's Place. Uh, Sophia Magad, who is a principal transport engineer uh, at Montmartre. McDonald, sorry, um, and we've got May Man Oram, who leads the Access and Inclusive Environments at Arab. Um, facilitating today uh, will be Lisa Mulligan, who is the Group Diversity and Inclusion Director at Wally. Um, so I'll now pass on to you, Lisa, and hopefully everyone gets to enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much, Doreen. And what a fantastic panel we have today. Um, and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Um, you know, I think when often when we think about disabilities, I think we often think about physical disabilities. We think about people in wheelchairs or we think about people who might be blind or maybe deaf. Um, but today we're actually going to talk about invisible disabilities and, and what, does, what does that even mean and how can we build cities and buildings to accommodate not just people with disabilities, but how can we, we be inclusive for everyone? Um, specifically, we, today we're talking about disabilities though. Um, I wanted to let you know that at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box and I might be pulling, you're welcome to put your questions there and I might ask the panel questions throughout or otherwise we have some time put aside at the end. So if there's any questions you have of our panelists, we'll certainly try and get to those um, as well. So pop them in the Q&A box. Um, but what I really wanted to start with is what do we mean by invisible disabilities? You know, I think, I think we know what a physical disability is, but what is an individual disability? And I'm gonna to go to Ron Lowe first. Yeah, I, I think uh, in terms of invisible disabilities, the first thing that comes to people's mind is uh, examples are like deafness, uh, intellectual disabilities, as well as autism. But I think uh, particularly in Singapore, uh, it's good to know that uh, we feel that there's a much more growing awareness of uh, invisible disabilities. It's not just about uh, seeing uh, wheelchair users as well. Uh, we feel that there's a greater awareness because the also, there's an increased publicity, include, uh, also increase of sharing of stories. In particular, if you notice, there's a lot of stories out there uh, about persons with autism. So it's good that uh, these stories are being pushed out there such that people can actually understand and also get getting a greater awareness of how to engage persons with disabilities. Because I think one of the challenge that uh, people might face is that they might be wondering, how do I actually engage a person uh, with invisible, invisible disabilities. So I thought that uh, for the past few years, uh, there's a growing awareness of uh, invisible disability in Singapore and it's something that we look forward that we need to push the message out there uh, even further. Yeah, that's so fantastic to hear, Ron, that there is a growing need or a growing um, awareness in Singapore to start talking about invisible disabilities and what they actually mean and how do we, how do we interact with people who might have an invisible disability. Um, Sophia, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what, 
what would an inclusive city mean to you? Like, how would you how would you describe that to our um, our audience? Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, inclusive, inclusive cities are, in fact, part of uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, where SDG 11 calls for inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities. Um, inclusive cities are those that value uh, all people and their needs and uh, contributions equally. Um, according to the World Bank, inclusive cities involves uh, multiple spatial, uh, so social and economic factors where spatial inclusion means uh, urban inclusion requires um, providing affordable necessities such as housing, water and sanitation. Um, in economic inclusion uh, means creating jobs and giving urban residents the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of economic growth. Uh, and social inclusion, um, where, where recently the lack of opportunities of the urban poor, um, greater demand for voice from the socially excluded, um, may have excavated um, incidents of social upheaval in cities. So an in inclusive city needs to guarantee equal rights and participation for all, uh, including the most marginalized, um, and this includes those with disabilities, um, either visible or otherwise. So the spatial, um, economic and social dimensions of uh, urban inclusion are very tightly intertwined in a complex web uh, and they tend to reinforce each other. So essentially, Lisa, um, inclusive cities aim to not leave anyone behind and to allow residents to prosper together regardless of their class, gender, ethnic background, age or abilities. Um, so with the... Yeah, sorry, 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 Sophie, I was just going to say that's a beautiful description, but keep going. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. So um, I just wanted to tie that um, that um, summary uh, given by the World Bank with what Ron has just mentioned with um, the invisible disabilities that, um, that uh, he has listed. Um, living with non-invisible disabilities already makes li uh, daily life more demanding for millions of people. Um, not least of which being considered uh, and labeled uh, with the word disabled. Um, inclusive cities for people with invisible disabilities is a vision where city um, spatial, economic and social infrastructure has been given consideration to the needs of those with uh, invisible disabilities. So I, I hope that um, that summarizes nicely um, what yeah. inclusive cities for invisible disabilities means to me. No, thank you, Sophia. That was a great, a great description and I liked the aspects of, you know, there's the physical side of it, there's the social side, and there's also the economic side. And that was something that I wanted to pick up on um, and come, come across to Batia because people who have disabilities and their carers can often be challenged financially because often they can't participate in work in the same way as if you don't have a disability. So when we're thinking about the financial challenges and also, also healthcare, how can we organize and prepare ourselves for these challenges? Thank you, Lisa. So studies have shown that financial stress affects health and poor health affects finances. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. So how I like to look at it is I like to look at what I call the three pillars of well-being. It's financial well-being, physical well-being, and mental well-being. And these three pillars actually cross over and have a lot of correlation. And the common theme amongst all these three pillars is about getting peace of mind. So let me explain a little bit more. What, what, what is financial well-being? Now, financial well-being will be different for different people. And why? Because every individual, every family has their own personal financial goals an objective and, and what are you trying to achieve? So the first thing I say when you're understanding your financial well-being is understand what's important to you. Forget about your neighbors or your friends, forget about that perfectly curated Instagram account, it's fake, okay? And, and, and look within, within your own family and, and what's important to you. What, what are you planning for? What are your goals? It's about having control of your finances and understanding them. Do you understand your daily, your weekly, your monthly, your annual expenses? How can you control something if you don't understand it? Financial well-being is also about 
having the capacity to absorb a financial shock, having an emergency fund. And, and if you have a disability or an invisible disability, this may actually occur more frequently. So have you catered some buffer into your financial planning for that emergency, for that rainy day? Okay, because life, life does not go according to plan, okay, for anyone. So we really have to factor that unknown into our financial planning. And finally, financial well-being is having the freedom to make the choices to enjoy the life that we want to live. Okay, and, and, and that's why financial planning is so important. It's your life you can take responsibility, take control, you come up with a good, robust plan. The second pillar is physical well-being. And, and yes, I'm talking about sleeping well, exercising, eating healthy, um, you know, maintaining a good weight. All of that's important. Um, you do actually need money and finances for that. Uh, it was interesting on the weekend, um, I took one of my sons um, out for McDonald's. No, no judgment, um, but the cost of his happy meal was the same price as an avocado that I bought for myself. And I mean, I'm trying to eat healthy and cut him an avocado. I could have bought a hamburger, French fries and a, and a soda. Okay, so you do need money for that. But physical well-being goes a little bit beyond. And I look at it as protection. And, and what is protection? Insurance. Okay, so important. Now, generally, when you talk about protection and investments, there are two separate things. All right, investments about investing your money, you want to get maximum return. Protection and insurance is about protecting your needs. Okay, and understanding what your needs are. Protection and insurance needs will be different from individual and families. And, and what you need to understand is, what are you protecting? What, what insurance do you need? Do, do you actually need insurance? How much coverage do you need? What is enough? What isn't enough? Um, some things to understand about insurance uh, is that you generally only get insurance when you're healthy. Okay, so that comes up with the, so what happens when you are unhealthy? Well, that's why it's important to review your insurance needs and take it out early. Um, insurance also gets more expensive the older you get. So my, what I do is I encourage people to understand what your real needs are and make sure that you have the right products, the right coverage to protect your family needs and understand what the product features are, the exclusions, the excesses. Um, you don't want to be caught by surprise that you're not covered for something. Okay, so so that that's the physical well-being. Uh, and the final pillar is the mental well-being. Uh, and, you know, the old age saying healthy is well is, is so important. And do you know that um, in 2019, Cigna did a 360 well-being survey. And they found that 90 Two percent of working Singaporeans are stressed. That's higher than the global average of 84 percent. And what they stressed about, the number one stress is money. 72 percent of Americans are stressed about money. 77 percent of residents in the UK are stressed about money. And Lisa, you spoke about the social and economic impact. On average, Stress causes the U.S. about, it costs the U.S. about $300 billion every year. So stress is proven to damage the immune system. It reduces cognitive function. It increases poor decision making. Okay, and this has a vicious cycle of ill health and financial hardship. So the mental well-being and that stress element is so important it, and it has a direct impact 
on your finances. And if you look at the society that had, you know, in debt, we have more people having stroke and heart disease and mental health. And the underlying cause is finances. So, sorry, a long answer, but, you know, it, it shows you how these three pillars are so important and you can't look at them in isolation. And you really need to take a holistic approach and plan. Because once you plan, you have peace of mind. And, and that, that helps so much with helping you setting you up for future success. That's some really great advice, Batia. I'm, I'm astounded by those stress figures that 92% of Singaporeans are stressed about, about money mainly. That's um, extraordinary. And I'm sure if you have a family member who has a disability or you're disabled yourself, um, that's probably an even higher figure if it could be possible. Um, but I liked your, I really liked your advice about creating a buffer and, and having a plan. I think that's really important. Um, and I wanted to come to you, Ron, because I know that the Singapore government has made some changes around um, including people with disabilities. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think it connects with what Batya was saying. Yeah. So I think uh, the Singapore government has uh, has a quite a number of programs. Uh, I think uh, one part that the SG Enable has been focusing on for the past few years is really about uh, uh, to be inclusive. To be an inclusive society, I think uh, everybody knows that uh, part of our identity is our career. So actually, SG Enable has been um, have several programs that actually we try to do job placements and also engage employers to, to hire persons with disabilities. So I think, uh, like what Batya said about the financial well-being, so, so I think it's not just about uh, earning money, but I think it's being a sense of being part of society when you have a job. So that's why uh, SG Enable has uh, a number of uh, employment training programs. Uh, the support system is there, but one thing that we really want to emphasize to companies as well uh, as to corporates, right? It's about uh, engaging the rest of the staff to be aware of the disability. Uh, like I said earlier, I think one of the uh, hesitation has always been how does a person with disability fit into the organization? So in SG Enable, we have job coaches as well as consultants to work with the HR department of corporates to really try to how to raise awareness among the company staff. Like, uh, for example, if uh, a person with uh, deafness uh, joins, a, joins a company, right? so what are the preparation or actually just to address any apprehension of the colleagues to how to engage a person uh, with deafness. So we do have uh, uh, consultants working with the HR department directly. It could be as simple as uh, in meetings, for example, uh, right now everybody has gone onto Zoom, right, to have meetings within, within uh, the teams as well. So what we found out is that uh, having Zoom, right, is an issue with uh, persons who, who has deafness because they can't actually listen to the conversations during Zoom. So uh, it could be as simple as having live captioning using Google, uh, Google Translation, right, that has live captioning functions or even having just a colleague to be able to type out in the chat box of the questions that are being discussed or, or the issues that are being discussed in the, during the meeting. So uh, SG Enable tries to engage the corporates or even the community, right? To actually try to reduce this uh, apprehension about engaging persons with disabilities. And uh, many of our experience has shown that the barriers is not as high as people has imagined. It's just about understanding and making certain uh, small changes to our work process. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, maybe some of our, our audience didn't realise the work that SG Enable um, does, which is really valuable. And the piece that really stuck with me was about helping and encouraging people to get jobs and that, you know, when, when you have a job and, you, and you're going out into the world every day, you actually do feel like you're part of society and you do feel more included. And, you know, I know when I've been out of work, that feeling is quite 
you know, you don't feel as good about as when you're out there contributing to society. So I think that's such an important inclusion piece. Um, and from there, I wanted to go and talk about, you know, how can we design inclusive cities? And we have a great panel who um, work for big engineering firms like I do. And so I want to I want to come to you and talk about um, inclusive cities. So Miyi, I wanted to start with you about, you know, how can we design well for everyone? So how can we, how can we go from where we are now and how we design to to making sure that we're inclusive? Yeah. Um, so I think I think. <clears throat> so excuse me. Um, I think just uh, sort of going back on to um, you mentioned before the the, the word that Vatia had used about um, you know having a buffer. I think that does yeah. translate into the design side of things as well. Um, and it's, uh, I think, um, I, uh, that someone mentioned earlier on as well about the fact that, you know, designing inclusively is about designing good design for everyone um, throughout our society. So it's about appreciating and recognising that diversity that exists and making sure that there is that, uh, I suppose, that flexibility and that adapt adaptability within the designs to accommodate different choices, different preferences, and also to future proof as well, so that you do have that ability to change um, the built environment as people's needs change as well through through different um, through different <coughs> stages of their life. Um, and, and, you know, there are different circumstances that, that might um, arise out of that as well. And I think one of the one of the big things is about, um, I, I suppose, recognising that um, in terms of sort of legislation and, and sort of regulations and standards, they're all based on sort of averages that are taken at a certain point in time. And so anyone who kind of falls outside of that, uh, outside of those averages or at any point sort of beyond that, initial point that that those that those uh, that that data has been taken um you know we're, we're already sort of out of date we're already designing things that aren't necessarily reflecting um the the needs of the of the societies that we should be designing for um and so i think it's really important as part of that inclusive design process to actually um you know root it in lived experience um, but also to think about those emerging trends and changing demographics as well, so that there's an opportunity to, as I say, to, to feature bit proof and to build in that flexibility and adaptability. And thinking, yeah, I love also, that. Sorry, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say as well. I think I think um, there was something that Ron had said about um, you know the the uh, you know Zoom and and um, sort of using technologies and how that fits into things as well and I think that's a really important part you know because it's not just about human interaction with buildings but it's also about how humans then interact with other humans and how it, you know with with the increase in, in technology as well how that actually um, how humans interact with technology as well and how, how that all fits together and thinking about it in a much more holistic way um, and there were a couple of um, uh, sort of things that kind of sprang to mind really um, in, in relation to, uh, I, I suppose, just to illustrate some of those points. Um, so my, my dad's got Alzheimer's um, and uh, there's, there's uh, I, re I remember a particular time that I was at the airport with him um, and there were a few few issues actually with the with the design of the airport, but um, the first one was the fact that he needed to use uh, the bathroom, um, and it was gendered. So you had male toilets, you had female toilets. I was the only one with him, and so actually, he I, I wasn't able to accompany him. I wasn't able to assist him, um, and so again, just just as a very um, sort of simple illustration of how inclusive design can be good for everyone. You know, if there were a mixed gender or non-gender toilet, I could have assisted him. It also would benefit other other um, other uh, sort of the demographics of well, people who are sort of who identify in a non-binary um, non-binary way. P other people who have sort of mixed um, you know gender families and um, thinking about it from that perspective. Um, but then the other, the second issue was that um, in terms of the hand washing facilities, that they had those, uh, you've pr probably all seen them, but the ones that are kind of hidden away that, that you know, that are kind of uh, um, designed so that it's, 
inconspicuous so that you can't actually see what's happening. You kind of wave your hand and it's all automatic and things appear from the wall. Um, and again, for, for my dad um, with his uh, with his Alzheimer's, it was it was just completely against everything that he had a memory of in terms of how to wash his hands and understanding of what was happening. And it just wasn't intuitive. It wasn't legible um, for him and not not very obvious. So um, yeah, just uh, just as an illustration, I think, of how, again, that yeah. interaction with the built environment is um, absolutely integral to, um, to to how people actually function. Yeah, there's such great examples, Mie. I think, you know, we do have an ageing population, which is one demographic that exists in our communities. And, you know, how can we design for that as, as, as well as you know, invisible disabilities as well as, as, well as other disabilities. Um, the taps are fascinating to me, actually, because that's a, supposed to be a technology that, that makes things easier, that you waste less water. Um, and generally, when I'm in a bathroom, I find that they're not usually working the way they were intended. So there's, there's some challenges with the technology there. Um, I notice when I'm out in cities with my son who is vision impaired, you know, I often notice the things that for people who can't see as well, and, and it's not just people who have a, a, a sight disability, but people who wear glasses or, you know, who just generally can't see very well, how hard the environments can sometimes be. Um, so Sophia, I wanted to talk to you about you know, what are the barriers that you see now that exist for disabled people and, and how can we remove these barriers? Um, thanks again, Lisa, for your question. Um, but before I go on to that, um, I just wanted to point out that May's summary is excellent and really emphasises that um, inclusive city design is all about uh, being people focused and it needs to be flexible and adaptable from not only the one who is facing a disability, but for the caregiver as well. Um, and as highlighted by Ron earlier, the increase of awareness in Singapore has brought about some great in initiatives by um, the government agencies and organizations. Um, but back to your question about um, the barriers that I have witnessed, um, it, it may not be a, a first-hand witnessing um, experience at all, but uh, you know, we, we, unfortunately, it has been reported that uh, some great initiatives um, have posed certain barriers to the ones the initiatives were designed for in the first place. Um, for example, with LTA's most recent uh, trial about a new initiative to help um, commuters with invisible medical conditions, a sticker that says, uh, excuse me, may I have a seat, please, um, is provided upon request by a commuter at selected MRT stations. It was reported that during the trial, a medical certificate would be requested by the station master. But as a person with a disability myself, Lisa, um, and for everyone on the call, I'm an amputee with, uh, from a very young age due to a birth defect. I do not carry around a medical certificate um, stating my condition. In fact, I've never had a, a, a document on me, um, you know, certifying um, uh, my, my, my uh, physical condition and the fact that I use a prosthesis. Um, so while I understand that there is a possibility of abuse of this initiative, um, to me, um, just, you know, seeking uh, some verification in terms of um, a me medical certificate poses as an additional barrier um, to those with disabilities, um, I, I, whether visible or otherwise, to enjoy the initiatives that were meant to ease their lives in the first place. Um, but as a follow-up, uh, quite fortunately, a more recent press article uh, from LTA does outline a more permanent solution to this, uh, where commuters with long-term conditions can apply for a lanyard to uh, wear during their commute. Um, those with temporary conditions can still request for a sticker, uh, and it does not mention the need for a verification. Uh, so hopefully feedback um, from, from um, the focus groups uh, and these communities themselves have um, directed them to do away with the need for verification. Um, I'd like to share other examples also um, where uh, an initiative caters to one group and excludes the other. <clears throat> so, for example, in Thailand, um, lifts at a certain mall uh, were fitted with foot pedals. Um, this was in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where the intention was to minimize contamination of the hands um, without the use of, of pressing buttons at all. 
So the idea of foot pedals is brilliant for those um, uh, for those who are limb impaired without the mobility of their hands. However, in the same strain, um, a mall in the US uh, installed hand san sanitizers for patrons. And the design is, uh, uh, the system was designed to discharge some hand sanitizer using a foot pedal. And uh, what I read was, um, it was quite an, an unfortunate um, incident for a wheelchair user who was not able to use the foot pedals uh, to dispense the hand sanitizers that was supposed to be made available for him. So um, inclusive design needs to be, again, um, you know, just to reiterate, it has to be people focused, but it still has to be flexible and adaptable to various needs. Um, auditory and visual cues, expectancy of um, bus and train arrivals to reduce anxiety and warning announcements that should not trigger those with sensory processing disorders are examples um, that inclusive design um, can adopt. But designers should try to put these in place, um, not at the expense of others. So um, yeah, I think um, that, that's my piece on, on barriers that, that could arise and how to overcome it um, in inclusive cities. Thank you so much, Sophia. They were some really fantastic examples and I can't believe you don't carry your medical certificate with you wherever you go. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> I have to write one for myself. Right now. <laughs> I, I, I picture you like, you know, holding up your skirt or something to show people your leg <laughs> or arm. <laughs> it's craziness, isn't it? But, you know, it's good. What I like about some of the things that are happening in Singapore is that the LTA are running tests and working with community and taking feedback and making changes. And, and you know, that's, I think, exactly what inclusive design is about, that sometimes even though your intention is good, like having a foot pedal, to dispense um, hand sanitizer, very good intention. Execution's not gonna work for everyone, but it's that iterative process in design about coming back and making changes. And, you know, and I think that's the really important bit, isn't it? Um, Ron, how is SG Enable working with communities to address some of the challenges that Sophia was talking about? Yeah, I think uh, Sophia brought up a good point. I think the main point about inclusive design is really about adopting uh, design thinking methodology where we do iterative. It's not just about iterative, but really engaging the end users to really uh, get the feedback so that every iteration design that you make, it incorporates the feedback. So one of the uh, challenges that always comes to mind about uh, building public infrastructure is that uh, a good example is the tech house on the floor that actually helps to guide a blind person. But having too much tactiles on the floor will also impede a wheelchair user, for example, because a tactile will make it very hard for someone to push a wheelchair across the path. So it's something that uh, actually Enable is trying to engage more designer, the design community to really engage them to see whether we can actually build in a more inclusive user experience. So it's not just about the design, it's about the experience. So, uh, that's definitely, I think the thing that we must realize is there won't be one solution to fit all, right? There won't be one solution that will solve all issues, but really how can we incorporate the different uh, design solutions to create that inclusive experience? One example is like accessible toilets, right? When we say we want to make uh, the toilet to be accessible, right? It's not just having grab bars everywhere for people to hold on to, it's also uh, how you design, uh, where the sink should be, where should be a toilet be, and where should be a changing table be, and how you actually co-locate each of them such that it's easy for the caregivers to move their child from uh, one area to another. So it's not just having a uh, product that's accessible, it's really how do you put all of them together to be inclusive as well. Oh. So, yeah, I, I, one thing, one point I want to add about uh, inclusive design, uh, I think May also pointed out, it's not just about designing for persons with disabilities. <laughs> I think when we have good inclusive design, it actually benefit everyone as well. For example, if I have uh, accessible uh, pathways, uh, parents with baby strollers will also find the experience to be uh, good. So, when we engage corporates and businesses, we always try to emphasize to them that when SG Enable comes to them, 
it's not just about engaging them for persons with disabilities. Actually, uh, when they have good inclusive design, it also will help them uh, market their products better and improve the, the experience for their customers as well. So actually, there's a quote that I would like to mention from Google. So Eve Anderson, who's a director of accessibility engineering at Google, uh, he pointed out that uh, accessibility problems of today are the mainstream breakthroughs of tomorrow. I think if you look at Google products, it really exemplifies what they feel because uh, virtual assistants using uh, uh, devices activated by voice right, used to be very uh, much uh, for persons with disabilities. Uh, in today's context, everybody is using Google Assistant to turn on the Spotify, to turn on the Netflix. So actually, uh, when we focus on the accessibility problems, there's a huge potential that this will open up the innovation for the companies as well. That's a great point, Ron. Um, I think, you know, that I love that notion of, you know, a breakthrough in inclusive design today is something mainstream in the future. And we know that um, electric toothbrushes were designed for people with a particular disability, but, you know, most of the population would use an electric toothbrush. Um, also the text on videos, I mean, how many of us have been on the MRT or a bus and we're watching a video, but we're reading the text because we don't want to have the sound on to annoy other passengers. So um, there's some so, such good examples that inclusive design can help such a wide group of people. Um, I just want to, I'm going to come back to you, Ron, because I want to get you to, if you're comfortable, to talk a little bit about the changes to the healthcare in CPF, um, which is, I think that was you that was telling me about some additional insurance oh, coverage. Yeah. I'll come back to you though, you can have a thing. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say to all our audience, um, if you have any questions, we do have the Q&A box. I'd love to see some questions. We've got some really clever, talented people on the call to speak to. So please pop your questions in. Um, so Ron, can you talk a little bit about the changes to the insurance and CPF and how that benefits people with a disability? Yeah, so, uh, so it's really about, I think recently last year, uh, the government actually launched the casual life. So I think uh, as what uh, Bakya mentioned earlier, uh, most of the challenge that uh, in terms of disability space was to get insurance, adequate insurance coverage, right? When you have a pre-existing condition, I think everybody knows that a pre-existing condition uh, is quite a challenge to, to get uh, insurance coverage. So actually last year, the government actually launched the Cash Your Life that actually covers uh, pre-existing, even if you have a pre-existing disability, uh, it actually provides uh, coverage if, for example, if your condition gets worse or there's uh, other disabilities that you acquire as you grow old. So this cash your life actually provides a uh, basic coverage for all Singapore citizens and PR. And of course, uh, like what Bajia said, uh, everybody also wants additional coverage depending on your situation. So I think the challenge still exists in Singapore where persons with disabilities who might want to get more coverage and they also will face the, the situation that the basic coverage that government provides does not adequately cover all the other expenses they might face down, down the line when they grow older. So the government has taken the first step to provide that basic coverage, but I think there needs to be more done to engage the insurance providers because uh, in, in Singapore, we have the rider schemes. How do we, how can the insurance providers design the rider schemes such that it can suit the needs of persons with disabilities at different levels? Sure. Batia, yeah. did you want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, so the Care Shield Live is a fantastic product, um, but it's only available to Singaporeans and PRs. Um, so for expats, it's not available. It's only available for people born before 1980. Um, so the government are working something. So if you're born after 1980, they are, from the end of this year, they are going to have some measures, but it won't exclude pre-existing disabilities because obviously the older population is probably much of a cost but the yeah, CPF life um, the, uh, the um, cash your life sorry is available for all Singaporeans or permanent residents 
You were born before 1980 and it gives a monthly payout for life. So yeah. fantastic product um, available. And I think the government are looking at more initiatives, more programs as well. And this is paid yeah. for by the CF as well. Yeah. It's a fantastic start though, I think. And, um, you know, when when we were preparing this panel and we were talking to Batia about what do you do if you have a pre-existing disability, how can you get coverage? And um, through private insurance, it's very difficult and it is really up to governments to start to push the agenda on some of these things. So communities have access to good healthcare, um, no matter who they are. We've got a great and tricky question in the chat. Um, I'm gonna come to you first, Miyi, and then maybe to you, Sophia. Um, so it's from Mary Lise, thank you. She said, great practical examples on inclusive design. Can we have the panelists also give their views on the social stigma that is strong in Singapore around disabilities, including and maybe especially, especially visible disabilities, how to contribute to a cultural transformation? Uh, Miyi? <laughs> So I think the the first thing that kind of springs to mind really is about um, sort of representation, um, and I think I think there's a lot that can be said about um, uh, I suppose how how people and how that diversity and how disability is actually portrayed by media, by um, you know, and, and and also how how it's actually represented in in our in our professions as well so going back to um the point that um was made earlier about having that lived experience embedded into inclusive design i think it's really important that actually um as part of who's designing you know that that that, that we need to that we need to actually um have that diversity within our teams in the first instance as well um and there's there's a particular example which isn't disability related, but I think illustrates it quite well, which is that um, I think it must must have been a couple of years ago now there was <coughs> sorry excuse me um, a couple of years ago there was a um, uh, a soap dispenser uh, designed for bathrooms, and when they launched it, they realised that actually it was an auto one of those automatic dispensers that I, I kind of mentioned earlier on. Um, but when they launched it, they realised that um, it didn't recognise certain skin tones um, or skin tones past a certain tone, um, and. I don't think it was something intentional. I, I, I really hope not anyway, um, but it was something that most likely um, uh, arose from the fact that they didn't have that diversity within their teams. They didn't have that diversity within the, the, the prototyping and the testing stages as well. So actually they they launched this pro product probably in very good will thinking that actually it it, it 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 met all the standards that they were that they were needing to meet um and so i think i think yeah that representation i think is is a really really key thing yeah that's a great point sophia would you add to that yes sure um yeah uh, just just to add on uh on may's point about representation um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll address uh, the social stigma part of Mary Lisa's um, question. Um, I feel that more and more uh, social stigma is being broken down, especially with the pride that Singapore has in um, our Paralympic uh, team. Um, they brought uh, back many, many medals. And uh, in fact, Yip Pin Siu, um, she's um, a heralded um, Paralympian. Uh, and she's, uh, in fact, a nominated member of parliament in, in the Singapore government right now. Um, so uh, representation um, can start at the very top, uh, of course, with, um, with exemplary um, citizens like Yip Pin. Um, but uh, also, you know, just thinking back on my own experience uh, with schools, um, when when I, uh, you know, be because of my birth defect, um, uh, relatives did recommend that um, I I would go to a non secular school, non government school, um, and to to go into a, a special needs school instead. Um, but my parents at that point of time uh, chose for me to to go into a government uh, school and. Um, the the fact that I was very different in in um, a primary school, uh, you know, made friends and yeah, there there was uh, the name calling and all, uh, which which I grew out of. But um, still, I I think that um, when when children are 
are exposed to uh, different sorts of abilities within um, their school uh, system. Um, you know, re representation starts at, at a very young age as well. Um, so how to contribute to a cultural transformation? Um, I think it is probably um, a, a more challenging question for me to answer, um, you know, just because of my professional background. But uh, what I can be for you is just um, my, my personal experience um, to, to answer this question. Uh, I'm not sure whether Ron, uh, you know, at an organizational level, he could um, give some input to, to uh, the second part of Mary Lisa's question. But thank yeah. you very much for inviting yeah. me. To Maybe yeah, I'll jump in here. I, I think when, uh, when we started the discussion, I was talking about really about uh, raising awareness and addressing any apprehension or hesitation that people might have. So in SG Enable, actually we organized quite a number of uh, initiatives and workshops uh, we have uh, 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 workshops that is targeted at employers. So they really to address very specific, if employers want to hire a uh, person with disabilities, we have workshops uh, for them to actually learn about and to clarify any doubts that they have. Because I think my employers, they might think, oh, I need to make a lot of changes. What do I have to do? So we have uh, se sessions that target employers. Then next, we also have uh, what we call consumer inclusion workshops as well. So we targeted businesses. So instead of seeing personal disabilities, but really how to how can they engage customers with disabilities? So uh, instead of uh, from a hiring point of view, we also engage organizations of engaging customers as well. So we have various uh, initiatives and workshops to actually address the apprehension and also to answer any questions that, that people might have. Then the last, uh, the other one that we have is, of course, we have, outreach activities where we engage directly with the community, with the uh, people out there, with the students, with the grassroots leaders. And recently, we also organized what we call Just Ask Me sessions. So we, uh, we are quite happy that we have volunteers with disabilities where they actually uh, are all the, actually lead in the, in the session and the public, the community can actually post any questions that they have to our volunteers. We really uh, put up the questions out there rather than being keeping quiet, hesitate, and wonder uh, with that many questions that I have. They can actually uh, engage uh, persons with disability directly to address any hesitation that, that they might have. Yeah. So, if anyone is interested out there, <laughs> you could approach me to organize such uh, events for your community or even with your companies. I think uh, how we conduct the workshops is really about uh, the experiential experience rather than experiential experience and be, feel free to ask any questions that you have about uh, engaging persons with disabilities. Yeah, I'd like to add what Ron said. I think it's up to every one of us as individuals to be open and honest and have conversations um, because everyone suffers from mental wellness issues. I mean, I'm generally an upbeat, optimistic person, but on Mondays I suffer from anxiety, you know, <laughs> throughout the weekend. And, and, I, and I say it, I'm, I'm just not feeling good today. And I think the more that people talk about it, the more people feel, hey, I'm not alone. Okay. And if I'm not alone, then it's okay to feel the way I do. And that breaks down the social stigma. So be authentic, be open, talk to people. I can promise you that Someone, there's so many other people going through what you are going through and, and there's support out there. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, firstly, I think that um, that idea around representation is so, so important. And so I love that both Mie and Sophia spoke about that. And I think Sophia, just you being in a, in a government school um, and being a bit different to the other kids is representation. And you had kids who grew up around you who knew that that was all okay and it was fine. And, you know, so just by, I guess, being at school, you're representing, you know, what it's like to, to be, have an amputee, have an amputated limb. So um, I thought that was fantastic. And Ron, I didn't know you guys did so many amazing workshops. Mm, um, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to learn, to learn that. Um, I had, I had one final question and um, you can all input into it, but I'm, I'm interested in, to know when have you designed for an invisible disability? And 
you know, I have an example when my son was little, um, he he uh, was very sensitive to loud noises. He probably has a sensory disorder in some way. He's possibly on the autism spectrum. And when I would take him to a public bathroom, like he wouldn't want to go in because the noise of the hand dryers really scared him. And he's grown out of it. But I know that a lot of people with ADHD or who are on the autism spectrum find loud noises, as an example, as an issue. So has anyone got any experience either running in a workshop, Ron, or maybe designing for some invisible disabilities that you could talk about? Um, I'll come to you first, Mie. Do you have any examples? Um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> that there was a, a project that um, we worked with our uh, San Francisco colleagues on um, called Lighthouse for the Blind, um, which um, the, as an organization, they, um, they, uh, they, they provide services for people who are blind or partially sighted. Um, and within the building itself, there's, there's, um, it, there, there was quite a diverse um, uh, representation of, of uh, different disabilities within, within that local community. Um, and I think there's there's some very simple, I think, um, des design features which were incorporated as part of that, which I think are really, um, which were, you know, I, I think were really um, quite useful, uh, again, for, for the population that we were designing for, but also just generally as well in terms of having that legibility and that, that um, uh, sort of understanding of the space. Um, and so uh, to, just to kind of point out a couple, um, I think, you know, that there was a big focus on acoustics and, and, and sort of what kind of materials we were using so that as people were walking or if you were using a long cane, as you were kind of tapping along along the surface, there was a very clear understanding as to what type of space it was, whether it was circulation space, whether it was a task space space, whether it was, um, uh, yeah, an area where people needed to, to, um, to, to communicate more effectively and so therefore the, the acoustic properties would reflect that. Um, there were some, um, you know, that, that, that I think was very much um, together with the, with the lighting and with, with other sort of um, environmental cues would, would help people to be able to navigate that through that space much more independently um, and like I say create a much more legible um, environment and so I think there's things like that which are just embedded into into what we um, you know how, how the space is actually thought about and designed in the first instance and then there's um, if I if I can just sort of add another uh, sort of example of what was what was done at this particular uh, on in this particular project um, there were some very specific details which again integrated within the design no one notices it but makes a huge huge amount of difference which is in the um, reception desk um, there's just a little notch that's been created uh, on the edge of the reception desk and that's so that anyone who you, does use a long cane is able to just rest their cane against that notch um, it doesn't then fall off it doesn't you know it, 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 it frees up their hands to, to fill out forms or to do whatever it needs doing at that particular point um, and like I say, really neat detail, really, you know, that doesn't, um, it looks lovely and, and integrated from the start. No one notices, makes the world of difference. Great examples. Um, Ron or Sophia, do you have anything you'd like to add? Any examples? Yeah, Sophia? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, in, in Mont McDonald, um, the transport planning team uh, has also worked together with the human factors team. Uh, just to just to um, it, it all starts with uh, you know what, what to understand um, the existing uh, situation uh, we have had uh, undertaken uh, accompanied journeys with people of uh, with a range of disabilities to gain better insight into their experiences when traveling on foot or by bus tram taxi or train. Um, and it's really these first-hand observations uh, with structured interviews with um, the end users, uh, site audits of facilities uh, that help us analyze how physical design um, affects uh, people's behaviors and how it makes journeys um, easy or difficult for, for disabled travelers. Um, you know, without, without going uh, into the details, uh, there are also other projects where um, 
our survey start with a disaggregation between uh, gender and uh, the different types of um, uh, disabilities as well, uh, just so that um, there, there can be um, a, a comparison, um, you know, and to see whether the outcomes of um, our interventions um, in our projects are able to increase or improve um, uh, their experience on, uh, focused on, on the different uh, groups, marginalized groups, such as um, uh, males and females uh, and those with disabilities as well. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily uh, specific to only um, non-visible uh, uh, disabilities, but um, with the visible ones as well. Please. Ron, do you have any examples? Maybe yeah, we run any workshops? A, <laughs> yeah, I have a couple to share, just food for thought. Yeah, Thank I you. think uh, just, just be more controversial a bit. I think we've realized that restaurants have stopped using straws right, <laughs> because of the green movement. But bendy straws, you know, the straws that can bend, is actually quite crucial for persons with disability, especially for physical disabilities where they can't hold a cup. So it's something that we also uh, remind people that although you are not having straws, but do cater straws for persons with disabilities. So it, should, it can be as simple as the act, act of it. So uh, accessible products is everywhere. So it's just keeping a note ourselves that we could use it as a certain case and especially I think uh, with the participants here I think uh, I can share that Microsoft Office the Word documents the PowerPoint and the PDF that we create uh, both Microsoft has built in great accessibility features into their products that means uh, the way that you create the Word documents uh, it can be accessible to someone who's blind such that the screen reader can actually read out the document, read out PDF files. So, uh, so having such a great accessible products, but you still need people to actually use the accessible features to create accessible information for persons with disability, especially uh, persons with visual impairment. So I think it's not just about creating a product, but uh, I think as part of my team's job is to encourage people to use such accessible features so that we can, uh, uh, make this uh, information accessible to people. So actually, uh, yes, you enable because uh, everything is moving online. We are actually trying to engage more organizations to talk about uh, digital accessibility. There are actually uh, standards out there. There are tools out there that actually uh, actually allow us to make our websites, our digital products, a lot more accessible to persons with disabilities. So, but it's just about raising awareness that such uh, features and tools are available. So again, if anyone's interested in the participants to learn more, do approach me. And because I think that if we are able to make information accessible to people, information is really uh, right now part and parcel of our daily living especially in a very in an inclusive society, right? So uh, I think what we need to really do is how to make information accessible to everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Ron. And I had never thought about the issue with straws. Um, that was such a good point. And I think digital accessibility is probably the future as well, but we spend so much of our time online. So we're out of time today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you all. Thank you, Batia and Miyi um, and Sophia and Ron. I've learned so much. Um, and back to you, Doreen. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, for moderating today. And I'd like mm -hmm. to, you know, big thank you to all the panelists as well. Um, I think it was a great discussion and I just hope that everyone on the call today get get to appreciate um, the real complexity of, of what the invisible disability community faces. I, for one, understand, you know, um, a lot of those things that you've touched on today. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Um, now, I just wanna mention a few upcoming events for the chamber um, and that should be shown on the screen now. Um, and one last note, just to mention that you should be receiving a feedback form um, from the chamber. And if you could help us by filling it out, that would be great. Um, so yeah, just conscious of time. So thank you everyone and uh, hope to see you in future events. <laughs>